coming uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. And I'm going to turn the screen over to you so uh, we can learn. Let's see if I can. Uh, we, we went through this. Let me see. Uh, I share my screen. I says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, yes. OK. All right. So I will um, go ahead and play from start. OK, here we are. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you fine. I don't think yeah, we can. Yes. All right. Um, great. Um, so um, I used to um, study slugs until about seven, eight years ago, uh, especially the ones that live in Germantown, um, in, well, in Maryland and Germantown, especially because I lived in Germantown. Um, then I sort of gave up uh, on that project and um, shifted my attention to uh, the land snails, um, especially of Turkey. I am originally from Turkey. I started going back to Turkey uh, frequently. Um, so slugs went on the back burner. Um, and then uh, back, I think it was back in August that I received this invitation to um, consider giving this uh, presentation. I accepted it. Uh, so uh, to prepare for this talk, I started going over my, uh, through my old photographs and data. And it, um, it all came back to me. Of course, I had to refresh my memory. So I opened up my books and papers and relearned some of the stuff uh, about slugs. And uh, so it's been, it's been, um, uh, fun putting together this um, talk, and I hope you will enjoy listening to me. Um, so let's uh, let's get on with it. Uh, first, uh, I will uh, give a very brief introduction to the biology of slugs. But uh, before I go any further, I want to uh, thank the uh, Maryland um, Natural History Society, Natural History Society of Maryland, and especially. Uh, Bronwyn uh, Mitchell Strong for giving me this opportunity. Um, so uh, a brief introduction to the biology of slugs and what, what is a slug? Well, a slug is basically a snail that has lost um, uh, its shell incompletely or completely during evolution. Uh, most of you may know that slugs plus snails are gastropods. There are gastropods that live on land. There are gastropods that live in fresh waters and that, that are, there are gastropods that live in the sea, the seashells. Um, gastropods plus bivalves plus cephalop cephalopods and plus other groups make up the phylum mollusca. The second uh, largest um, phylum of animals after arthropods. So they, uh, they are uh, quite uh, populous and they are all over the place, especially in the sea. So here's a snail on the left. It's a Neohelix albolabris, the largest native Northeast U.S. snail is present in the in, in Maryland in in forests. Oops, um, oh, I don't know why it does that. Okay, um, and here's a, a, a slug. This is an introduced slug, uh, Arion subfascus, quite common in Maryland. What what are their uh, common um, um, traits? Well, the bodies look sort of the same. Um, gastropods have this specialized tissue called the mantle. In snails, it's, it's mostly within the shell. Uh, it covers the organs. But if you look at the, um, the opening of the shell, you can see the edge of the mantle coming out. And if you look uh, under the shell, you will see an opening here. That's, the, that's called the pneumostome. It's the opening into the lung. They have a lung inside the, in, inside the shell. Um, in slugs, there's the mantle. It covers, in most slugs, it's, it covers only a part of the anterior body. 
and there is the pneumostome. The lung is here under the mantle. And there, they of course have a most uh, uh, terrestrial um, snails have two pairs of tentacles. Uh, the, uh, the upper tentacles are longer and they have eyes at their tips. And there's a pair of much shorter lower tentacles. They're not visible in this picture, but you can see them here uh, in, in, in the picture of the snail. Uh, I'm sorry, in, the, in this photograph of the slug. Um, okay, the, the radula. This is an organ that basically um, uh, defines this, uh, uh, this the gastropods. It's, uh, it's, it's in the mouth, it's located in the mouth. It's a, a ribbon-like organ covered with rows of uh, teeth. This is the uh, radula of a snail. You can see the, um, the rows of teeth. They can be quite pointed and sharp. Uh, this was a rather sn small snail. So its radula was so small, but uh, a, a larger slug would of course have a much larger um, a radula. This is, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, the photograph of, of the mouth of a slug. Now, this was taken from below. We're looking into the mouth. Um, there's the radula. You can see, you maybe you should be able to see the rows of teeth on it. Right here, um, a line, oops, lining the um, top of the mouth is a um, hard plate called the, um, called the jaw. It's also present in, uh, in snails. Now I'm going to show you a, um, the, the, this photograph was taken from a video. I'm going to show you the actual video. Uh, this video was taken um, while the slug, this is a Derosaurus levy, um, was feeding. Um, the slug was on a glass plate. The glass plate itself was covered with wet cornstarch. And the, so the slug was feeding on it and the camera was below the uh, plate. So you can actually see the mouth of the slug. Um, uh, you can already see the, the jaw. And if you look carefully during the video, you can see the, uh, the radula come into focus every now and then. All right, so here we go. All right, so um, I hope you, 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 there's the radula right here. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So um, if you have, if your house has a north facing wall, and if you haven't had it um, power washed in a while, your siding may look like this. The, the, this is how mine looked a while ago before I had it cleaned. Um, the, this is of course green algae growing on it. And these marks on it uh, were left by slugs feeding on the uh, algae. So this is a good way to um, um, tell that you have slugs in your garden and also um, learn about their, uh, the radula tracks. Uh, let's look at the, um, oh, here's another slug. This, this one was feeding on the side of a gutter. The picture was taken from um, below. And you can see all the, the these are all uh, radula tracks left by, left by the slugs. And this is a close up. Um, one of those uh, tracks left on the siding. Um, we had some disagreement over uh, these triangular marks. You can probably see them. I thought they were uh, the individual traces of the teeth on the, on the radula, but one of my colleagues disagreed and he said, oops, the, he said the teeth were actually um, much smaller. These were the um, marks left by one sweep of the radula. So um, I don't know, uh, he may be correct, but anyway, uh, you should also um, have um, tracks like these uh, on your sidings or uh, 
even on uh, trees. Um, all right. Uh, next. Okay. So let's let's uh, continue to compare snails and slugs. Um, what good is a snail shell? A snail shell has several uh, functions. It obviously protects the snail. Snails have um, very soft bodies, um, and they, unlike slugs, their uh, their organs, which are normally inside the shell, uh, are not actually. Um, they're out in the open, basically. If you if you remove the shell of a snail, you could see most of its organs. So the body protects the organs uh, against physical damage. It also protects the snail against water loss. And it also protects it uh, from getting too hot in the sun. And it also provides some protection against predators and parasites. Although many predators out there can easily break, for example, uh, rodents like rats and mice and uh, snails can easily break a snail shell and eat the snail inside. Here is another a native a snail common in Maryland, uh, Mesodon thyroidus. Uh, they tend to climb trees. And this one was, um, it, it, it had attached itself to the tree trunk. And if you look carefully, you will see this uh, chamber of dry mucus sealing its aperture. The snail's, snail's mental is visibly in right here. So this, this was the snail was in a nice little um, protected like a room chamber. Um, I don't know why that happens. Okay. If you uh, went to uh, Mediterranean countries, you would occasionally come across these snail shells in, in, the, in the summer when it's dry and um, hot. They're just a, a simple ordinary uh, mucus shield is not enough. So snails build these thick um, calcium carbonate um, doors to seal their shells. Um, these are called epiphrans. Um, within the shell, the snail can withstand the heat and the dryness of the summer for uh, up to three, four, two, uh, four months. So slugs lack this protection. And as a result, especially in the spring and the summer, you can see a lot of slugs that have died on hot and dry sidewalks. They go through this period of, of sort of desperate uh, confusion, trying to find a refuge, but eventually just end up dying because they run out of water. Hey, Aiden, so, this is Bron hey, Aiden, this is Bronwyn. Robin had a quick question. The snail okay. that was attached to the tree with the mucus seal and the one that has the covering, how do they breathe? Um, they usually leave a little uh, hole. Uh, if you look closely, the, there may be one right here. There may be a little opening. Um, and these, these snails usually do leave a little slit. It's not visible in this picture, but uh, when the snail is in a shell like this, the breathing hole, the pneumostome is located right here. And this, there's, a, there's usually a little slit up here. If you look at it carefully on, under a microscope, you can, you can, you can see that slit. Uh, and, but in this case, I, I think I do see a little opening right here for, for the air to uh, come in and go out. Thank you. Okay, so if it's good to have a shell, why are there slugs? Um, to um, the, the, This old saying reminds us that too much of a good thing can be bad. Uh, and so being without a shell must have its own advantages. Um, 
a, a snail when it's growing grows not only its body but also its shell so it it requires energy and materials calcium carbonate primarily not only for its body but also for its shell a slug on the other hand grows only its body so um uh, the conclusion is that a slug would be expected to grow faster and start reproducing sooner than a snail of a comparable body size. A shell is, of course, extra weight to balance and carry. A slug, on the other hand, um, doesn't have a shell, so it can move faster to escape danger. Uh, we will, uh, uh, I will come back to this later. Um, a bulky shell on a snail's back can prevent it from entering um, very narrow spaces. A slug without a shell can enter very narrow crevices to escape danger. So not having a, a shell is not necessarily a bad thing. So where did uh, slugs come from? Slugs evolved from, um, snails. There are several lines of evidence uh, that uh, uh, indicate this. I'm not, uh, since this is not the topic of this presentation, I'm not going to go into any, uh, too much detail, um, but there's just one, um, uh, one um, clue that I want to talk about. Um, the, that's the internal uh, shells of slugs. Some slugs have a shell hidden inside their bodies. Um, this, the, uh, this is considered a vestigial shell. Um, not every individual may have such a shell. Uh, sometimes it may be very small. Um, it's not clear if these vestigial shells have any function. It's been um, proposed that it may serve as a uh, calcium carbonate store for their eggshells. Uh, this is a slug that I will talk about uh, in more detail later. Uh, um, th this picture was taken during um, a dissection. This is the mantle. I cut open the mantle and pulled it back, and there was uh, there was a slug. Uh, um, there was its a shell right inside the mantle cavity. It's not. It was not attached to anything. It was just a free piece of very thin shell just sitting there. So uh, let's move on. Okay, so it all comes down to sex and reproduction. All uh, slugs are her hermaphrodites. That means each slug has both male and female organs and produces eggs and sperm. There is the, uh, this is the uh, uh, a photograph of the genitalia of Megapellifera, a native slug. Uh, this is the penis, uh, there's the vagina, it's, it's very uh, short. Um, normally the genitalia are inside the body, so you, you can't, if you just look at a slug crawling across your uh, uh, driveway, you can't see its genitalia, they're inside the body. They are everted uh, right uh, before uh, mating. Um, they're the shapes and dimensions of these various parts differ between uh, different slug species. Some species have uh, longer penises, some have uh, longer vaginas, and some may not have certain parts, others may have them. So uh, often you need to um, cut them open and examine their genitalia to, uh, to uh, identify them. So when two uh, sexually mature slugs of the same species come together, they, they may mate and exchange, exchange sperm with each other. A uh, couple of pictures here. This, this is Derosaurus reticulatum uh, present in Maryland. Uh, they're not mating yet. This is their courtship. Uh, this is a very common um, um, uh, position of mating slugs. Uh, you can see that one um, slug's head is here and the other slugs is here. So they're sort of like opposite to each other and they slowly rotate around each other. Uh, 
in this species, these are called, uh, these are stimulators. They um, put them out before they start actually mating and they uh, stroke each other. This is sort of, uh, um, um, foreplay, uh, slug foreplay, so to speak. And here, this is, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, Arion subfuscus, they're actually mating. They have everted their uh, genitalia and the, the, the genitalia have uh, united and they're uh, in the process of uh, exchanging sperm with each other. Um, but many slugs also can also uh, produce eggs, viable eggs without mating. If, if no um, mate is available, they can, fertilize their own eggs with their own sperm. This is called selfing. It's a, it's a common process and it's also very useful um, if, there's, if there's no mate available, if there's just one individual and it can just produce eggs and start, a, start out a colony. Okay, um, so after they have mated, of course, uh, they produce eggs. Here's Arian subfuscus. Uh, the genital opening is right here. It's uh, normally you, you can't see it, but when they're getting ready to mate or when they're getting ready to uh, lay eggs, it becomes more uh, pronounced. And here's an egg that's coming out and the same slug after it has uh, produced a, a lot of eggs. They can, a, a single slug can produce many, many eggs. Okay, let's move on. Okay, most common slug species are Maryland. Um, first, we, I will start with um, the native slugs. They're, they all are in the family Philomycidae, and there are three genera, Megapalifera, Palifera, and Philomycus. Um, so how do you tell the difference between a, a native slug and an introduced slug? All of the slugs in the family Philomycidae have a, a very a long mantle that covers the entire back of the slug. This is as opposed to the introduced slugs where the mantle only covers approximately one third of the interior uh, uh, part of the slug. So that's an easy way to tell uh, if you have, if you're looking at um, native or an introduced slug. This is Megapellifera mutabilis, uh, a, a native and very common slug in Maryland. Um, you can find it in woods, in wooded areas. It likes, it likes to uh, climb trees, um, especially it's, it's very easy to uh, see on beech trees. I will uh, come back to that later. Um, okay. Um, all right, this is um, a, a, another native species common in um, Maryland, Philomycus carolinianus. It, if you um, look at this picture and this one here, you can see that they look quite alike. But this one has this um, parallel row of black uh, elongated um, marks on its back. So that, that, that's how you can recognize it. But it takes some time to uh, get used to uh, uh, the way these slugs look and to, uh, to be able to tell them apart. Uh, even then, they're not always easy. Uh, this particular specimen, specimen was from Beltwoods in uh, Prince George's County. Uh, what's uh, the, the, the distinction the slug has is that it was the, uh, the first native uh, terrestrial gastropod species that was described from North America. Um, it was described by this man named um, Louis Boss in 1802. He was a Frenchman. Um, he came to North America in the late 1790s. He spent about two years in Charleston, South Carolina. He was hoping to get a diploma diplomatic assignment. Um, it did eventually come, his letter came but uh, the, the president of the United States back then, I can't remember his name, um, turned down his assignment, not, not only his assignment, but 
all the French assignments, there was some political trouble back then between the US and the French. So he couldn't, he couldn't get his assignment and he packed up and left and went back to uh, France. And, uh, but he had a bunch of specimens with him. And so he described several new species of animals and plants from North America, including the slug, uh, which carries the name of the area where he had founded uh, Carolina. So it's uh, Carolinia, uh, Carolinianus. Uh, there are at least two other Philomycus species that are present in Maryland, Philomycus togatus and flexularis. Um, at least in my opinion, they are difficult to tell from uh, apart from each other. Um, sometimes even with dissection, uh, one cannot be sure what one has. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, the smallest native slugs of Maryland are in the genus Palifera, Palifera dorsalis and Palifera fosteri. Um, again, you can tell them from uh, introduced slugs because the mantle on their back covers the entire back. They live in forests, uh, but they're difficult to see, uh, notice because they're small and they have cryptic coloration. There may be other species present in Maryland, e even undescribed ones. The genus has not been revived since the late 1940s. Um, they're, they're small, so this, this one was only about 30 millimeters long. This, uh, this orange coloration that you can see through his mantle uh, was due to the carrot that I had fed it. Um, all right, so let's now talk about the non-native slugs. They were all introduced from Europe. They are, uh, they are in different families, Agriolimacidae, Arionidae, Limacidae. Uh, they differ from uh, the native species in dimensions and external, external appearances. There are some uh, species pairs that are difficult to separate from each other. They require dissection or DNA analysis. Um, there's, one, uh, there's a way of separating the families into two groups. If the pneumostome is in the anterior half, uh, the slug is in the family Arionidae. If it's in the posterior half, then the, uh, the slug is in either one of these uh, families. All right, a uh, famous slug, Limax maximus. Um, th there is the mantle and these patterns on its uh, mantle uh, give its, its common name, Leopard, Leopard slug. It is one of the largest slugs. Um, it is uh, the, the largest slug in uh, Eastern North America. It is believed to be native to Southern Europe, but it has been introduced uh, to many parts of the world, including North America. In Maryland, it's quite common in gardens, uh, empty lots, meadows, forest edges. Uh, this was uh, this uh, photographed in the, uh, in the back of my uh, house in Germantown. Okay, another uh, common slug, Arion subfuscus. Um, it's quite, it has this distinctive orange color, although it can be slightly brownish sometimes. It lives in, uh, again, gardens, meadows, forests. Um, it is a tree climber. It's very easy to spot, especially on beech trees. Sometimes they can go up quite high. This one was photographed from below. Uh, you can see how high it was. I'm about uh, five feet three, and this one was probably, you know, seven, eight feet above ground. Um, there's a similar species, Arion fuscus. It has also been introduced in North America and may be present in Maryland. Uh, apparently, uh, the, the two species are difficult to tell apart, and again, one may need to resort to dissection. Uh, this is the uh, smallest non-native slug uh, in North America, also in Maryland. It grows only to about 20 millimeters in length. Um, it's easily recognized by its whitish grayish color and 
very dark black head and black tentacles. It also has these tubercles on its back. They become very pronounced when the slug is contracted. Uh, again, it lives in gardens, forests, and uh, meadows. Um, hey, um, hey, hey, this is Bronwyn again. Laura wanted to know um, in the in the slug before this, why do they climb the trees? What are they getting up the tree? Um, I, I, okay, I will. <clears throat> they they eat. They eat the, again. Once again, the algae that grows on the um, on the bark. I will um, I will talk about that uh, later. I have some pictures. Um, okay, so here is another um, genus, Deroceras, uh, introdu uh, genus of introduced slugs. There are two species uh, common, commonly found again in gardens as well as forests. Deroceras reticulatum is a larger one. Is the larger one. It grows up to about fifty millimeters. Its um, skin uh, has this um, reticulated pattern. Uh, very distinct, and that gives the slug its uh, specific name. Um, the second one is Duracerus levi. It's a smaller slug that grows only about 25 millimeters in length. It's darker colored and um, under low light conditions, especially at night, if you see, if you happen to see one, it, it looks black. It looks very black, actually. Um, this slug is widespread. Its native range appeared uh, appears to extend from Europe all the way across Northern Asia, possibly to North America. Um, some people believe that it is in fact native to North America, including to the US. Um, so some, some colonies of it may be native and others may be introduced. Um, one more slug, Amb Ambigo Limax valentianus. Uh, this has a uh, confusing um, taxonomical history. It used to be uh, identified as Limax margin, marginatus, but that was a, apparently a misidentification. There, uh, there is indeed a species called now called Lemania marginata, but what the early authors thought was this species, species was actually this one. Now it's called Lemania. Uh, it used to be called Lemania valentianus. But now it's Ambigo Limax Valentianus. Um, animal taxonomy could be quite confusing, and it's always in a fluid state, and names constantly change. Um, so you just get used to it after a while. Um, it is uh, dissection is necessary to identify it. This was um, I found this in my backyard uh, some years ago, about fifty millimeters long, and um, I then dissected it, and um, this is the penis, and th this species has this protuberance here, appendix, and that identifies it as this species. Um, its first record was from California, dating back to 1930. Uh, there is a record of it as Limax marginatus from Maryland that was published in 1960, but um, there was no further information given um, the record that doesn't stay where in Maryland um, it had been found. So they are around, they're not very common. They're not as common as the previous species, but they are out there. So here's finally a slug that I have not uh, identified it yet. Um, when the winter comes, all the slugs go hiding, they go underground or they, uh, they just disappear, except for this particular species. It lives in the uh, grassy areas behind my house and on uh, wet uh, winter mornings, as long as the temperature, air temperature is above freezing, they come out and they, they're very easy to see on the uh, hiking trails. This is the lowest temperature lowest air temperature at which I have so far seen them. Uh, this one was photographed at three degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Fahrenheit back in the December of 2018. Um, it has a very distinct orange soul. Um, it's next to this thing. I think it's a, a tulip poplar uh, seed. So it'll give you an idea of 
its, its length. I have not uh, dissected one yet, so I don't have a, a definite identification as to which of these species it may be. Uh, one of these days, I'm hoping to do that. All right, so let's uh, move on to some natural history observations of Maryland slugs. Uh, what do slugs eat? <clears throat> uh, basically, they're herbivores. They feed on um, live and dead plant material. Here is a um, Deroceras reticulatum feeding on a discarded apple uh, along with these ants. This was photographed in my uh, backyard. But um, plants are not the only things they eat. They are very fond of eating dead earthworms. This is, I have come across this many times. If there's a dead earthworm, um, especially at night, uh, there's going to be a slug uh, feeding on it. Here we have um, uh, two species, Derosaurus reticulatum and Arion subpascus. I've even seen them eating um, um, live, injured, but live uh, earthworms. The earthworm would be moving, uh, squirming around, but the slug would be at the other end trying to chew on it. Um, here's a, a set of photographs. Um, they were taken two minutes apart. I thought this was interesting because it shows um, the slug, the same species, Derosaurus reticulatum, um, coming out from under the, this rock. And then a couple minutes later, it was right there uh, feeding on, the, on this earthworm. Did it smell it? How did it know that there was this um, food available? Um, I'm assuming they have a very good uh, sense of smell that they can tell that there is um, something, um, especially flesh that's um, available to uh, consume. All right, some other uh, interesting food, uh, um, foods that they feed on. Um, cat food, of course, uh, has lots of uh, protein, lots of fat in it, but even uh, poop. Here we have a, a Deroceras reticulatum and there's a snail. Snails apparently like to uh, feed on um, uh, poop also. And uh, they even uh, practice cannibalism. Um, this is a, a Deroceras reticulatum, and so was this. Unfortunately, it was uh, stepped on. And um, some minutes later, I returned, and this slug had appeared and started feeding on it. So uh, they don't mind feeding on their own species. Okay, so there's the answer to the question. Um, this is a native slug, Megapellifera mutabilis. It likes to climb trees um, because they feed on the algae that grow on the bark. Um, I, I believe they climb all trees, but they are much easier to spot on beech trees because beech trees have very smooth and light colored uh, barks. Uh, again, they can go up very high. If you go into woods uh, early in the morning after a rain, um, or if, if it's a foggy morning, if, if, it's, if the air is very humid, and if there are beech trees, you are likely to see these slugs uh, coming down like around nine o'clock or so. They, they start to come down to their uh, hiding places. Uh, this was a captive individual. I wanted to see if they were indeed, uh, if it would indeed feed on, um, uh, on the algae that was growing on this, on this piece of bark. So I offered it to it and you can see in this picture that it has its mouth right against the um, algae. And so it was feeding. And here, here is the same slug on, on the same piece of um, bark. Uh, you can see it's covered with algae here. This was taken a few hours later. The slug had left and there was basically no algae left on the, on the bark. So this shows that yes, they do feed on the uh, algae that 
grow on the bark. And that's why they climb up the trees. Um, this is something that uh, we discovered during our studies of these slugs. Um, Hodling is the name given to the aggreg aggregation of slugs. Um, they do that uh, to conserve, apparently to conserve water, uh, especially the slugs in the family, the Mesidae are known to do that. But we discovered that um, um, Megapolyferia mutabilis also does that in, in forests. They aggregate, they get together in these um, groups of uh, two to six, seven slugs in, in, in the holes of trees, especially the holes that have water in them. Um, and then they do something else. This is again um, a discovery that we haven't had the chance to publish. They dip their tails in the water. You can, it's difficult to uh, demonstrate this in photographs because the, you know, the water is difficult to photograph, but you can see that the surface is here and the, um, the slug's tail is in the water also here. Um, the surface of the water was right here. You can see some reflections and the tip of the tail was in the water. Um, I believe that they do this to uh, rehydrate their bodies. Um, as far as I know, this has not been reported in the literature and I haven't had a chance to um, publish it yet. Um, my colleague, um, Megan Postian and I have studied this in the, in, in, in the lab and they, they, can, they also demonstrate this behavior in the lab, captive slugs. If you uh, keep them away from water for uh, several hours and then put them in a container with little containers of water, um, they find the water and they dunk their bodies in it. So um, this is something we need to uh, write up and publish. All right, so <clears throat> now, now fun, uh, we come to the fun part. Um, this is the slug uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, it's a famous slug, Arian, uh, I'm sorry, Numax Maximus. Uh, what makes them famous is how they mate. Uh, they mate uh, uh, suspended in the air. Uh, these photographs, this was the first time I uh, witnessed this. Uh, this. These were taken in August 2007 in my garden. Um, this is a spectacle, spectacle um, uh, to be seen. And it's, it's like if you ever come across them mating, um, stop and watch them and take pictures. It's a long process, it takes about 45 to minutes to one hour. Um, people have studied this, they've been studying this since, uh, the, end, uh, since the late um, 1800s when it was first uh, reported in the literature. Uh, there, there, there appear to be very distinct stages that every pair goes through uh, during this process. Um, so it, it follows, it, it starts with a following. So one snail starts following the other. They climb up, the, the one in the front climbs up and the other one follows. They, uh, the one in the back often has its mouth attached to the, um, the tip of the tail of the one in the front. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing. They may be biting the one in the front or they may be um, um, eating its um, uh, mucus. And then they, uh, the next stage is circling. They start circling around each other. Again, in the opposite, one, one slug's head is uh, next to the other slug's tail. And then they um, start twisting their bodies around each other. And then they start um, hanging down on a string of mucus here. In this instance, this was a, a little bit um, unusual because they were not hanging, they were against this uh, trunk of this pine tree. Usually they, I'm going to show you a video later, usually they hang down. Uh, these are the penises. So in the next stage, their penises come out. Um, this is the penis of this slug here, and this is the penis of this slug. So you can see that when the first come when they first come out, the penis are, oops, the penises are cylindrical, and then they start to twist around 
um, intertwine around each other. Here is, you can see the, uh, the genital opening on the right side of this slug and the, and the penis is coming out and the genital opening of this slug and the penis is coming out and they're um, twisting around each other. And in the next stage, this um, um, enlarge, they, um, the penises become ribbon-like. They become very flat and they um, form this um, bell-like structure. Within the structure, the transfer of sperm takes place. One slug sperm goes to the to its partner, and the partner's slug, uh, sperm goes to uh, the uh, the first slug. And then, once this is completed, they separate from each other. Uh, the penises are again um, pulled back in, and they uh, go uh, separate and go on their own way. So. This, the entire process, once again, takes place almost an hour. Uh, so um, when I was preparing these slides, as I mentioned in the beginning, I had to go back and sort of um, refresh my memory. So I learned uh, all these different stages. Um, and then they, they were in my mind one morning about, uh, about a week ago. I came back from my morning walk and I had this, um, uh, this bird bath in my front yard and it happened to be empty on that morning and I took a took a look at it and I saw these two uh, slugs circling each other right away I said to myself oh they're going to get uh, they're getting ready to mate I have to take photographs I have to film them so it, this was at eight o'clock in the morning I had not had breakfast yet I postponed bra breakfast I sat down I took out my phone and I photographed them and I filmed them uh, again, it took about 50 minutes. And I have the video here and I'm going to show it to you. I, of course, the video is not 50 minutes long. I took short clips and combined them. I think it's about three or four minutes. Uh, so um, so they're right, they right at the um, edge of the um, bird bath. And this is the stage where they were uh, twisting their bodies around each other. And at the same time, starting to hang down. So there, there they are. Unlike the set of photographs I showed you, here they are in the air. They are hanging down from that string of mucus. Now, this isn't, they haven't started mating yet. This is actually, again, foreplay. Um, you can, um, okay, you can see their genital openings right here. There's a white, um, swelling right here and right here. So their, their penises are not out yet, but here, okay, we have, I have fast forwarded. Here are the penises. Okay, this is the penis of one slug and this is the penis of the other slug. The penises are now um, intertwining around each other. They, ha they have started to become um, ribbon-like. You can, you can see that they're, um, starting to form that bell-shaped um, um, structure. And this is in, inside which sperm transfer takes place. You can see how, how flat the penis have become. All right, now we're coming to the end now here they, they are, the penis are unraveling. They are slowly separating from each other. Again, you can see it's coming out, one penis is coming out from here. And 
And the other slug's penis is right here. So now they will be withdrawing their penises back into their bodies. All right, it, it drops on the ground. And in the next stage, this remaining slug climbs up that mucus string while uh, consuming it. This is the very end. It, it eats it up and then, uh, you know, gets to where it started from. All right, so this entire process took about 50 minutes and I was, very lucky to have witnessed it. Um, all right, now I have talked about sex. Now it's time for violence. Another video. Uh, in this video, there are two slugs. There's a levy. One, the one in the front was again on a glass plate coated with cornstarch. It was it was uh, happily feeding on it. And then this other uh, slug appeared in the back, same species. It initially was uh, blurry. It approached very um, quickly. And uh, you will see that it, um, once it comes into focus, it applies its mouth uh, very um, uh, sort of distinctively on the tail of this slug and gives it a big bite. So here, here we go. So the, the, this one here is, is feeding and this one is coming. Gives it a good bite and then it gets a slap on the head. And here we have the escape. Uh, maybe we, we can. I, this, is, this is my favorite uh, favorite scene. So we will we will watch it one more time. <laughs> All right. Here is the here is the um, attacker coming. Biting and getting a slap. All right, so why, why did it do that? I, I, I have no idea. All right, I will end with these two, uh, three slides. First, uh, uh, acknowledgments. Uh, uh, these following individuals have uh, contributed to, to this presentation with ideas, comments, and of course, corrections, Robert Cameron, of the University of Sheffield in the UK, in the UK, Megan Postian, Springfield, Virginia, and Tim Pierce of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. Um, I would very, uh, uh, I would recommend Professor Cameron's book, Slugs and Snails, for those of you out there who are interested in learning more about uh, slugs and snails. Uh, I can assure you that your cat will also enjoy reading it. However, um, it is a bit technical, so uh, uh, it may be um, a bit difficult for beginners. There are two um, um, web pages that gives information on both the uh, native and introduced snails and slugs of the United States. Um, one is uh, 
it was uh, put out by the, um, this is called terrestrial mollusk tool. It was a product of, I believe, USDA and, and the University of Florida. Um, and this is uh, a web page uh, prepared by the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. So I'll wait a few seconds for uh, anyone who, um, I'll wait for anyone who wants to write these um, addresses down. Aiden, while we're waiting on that, they had, um, Kathy wanted to know uh, what happened to that slug that fell off after, after uh, the it was, it just It fell on some uh, leaves on the ground and uh, it probably just uh, crawled away. I didn't, uh, I didn't follow it after that. It just probably crawled away somewhere. It, it didn't, you know, it wasn't harmed in any way. It just, because there were some grass, uh, some leaves on the ground and it just fell on them. Gotcha. That's probably, gotcha. yeah. Okay, so, and right, um, uh, it was like quarter to seven tonight. I um, remembered to add this uh, slide. I have a, a channel on YouTube um, it's called Unimportant Studies. I only have two videos there, but I will be posting the, the videos um, that I have showed you during this presentation there within the next few days. So if you want to watch them again, you can just go into YouTube and uh, if you search for, uh, search for Unimportant Studies, um, you can find my channel and the videos will be there. Uh, finally, I, I want to end on a, personal note, when I was reading this, um, the announcement for this talk, I noticed the sentence here. Uh, it says, these mucus covered invertebrates can crawl on a razor blade or a knife edge without a cut. This um, uh, sentence reminded me of this photograph of myself from a long time ago. Um, I had heard about this claim, but um, being the scientist that I have ever been, I wanted to check it out with my own eyes. So one day after, after a rain, when all the neighborhood scenarios were out, I went out with a razor blade. You, 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 it's difficult to see it here. Uh, it's right here, a very thin uh, thing that I was holding in my hand. And I made the, um, luckily, one of the uh, snails did climb over it and it indeed um, managed to get to the other side without hurting itself. So I can um, vouch for the truthfulness of that statement. Yes, snails and slugs can crawl over the edge of a, a, a blade. It's not too surprising that they can do that because they, first of all, they have um, a thick slime that protects their bodies. And also they can, as you can see here, they just, bend their bodies over the sharp edge. They don't even touch it. So, uh, but anyway, this was a, um, uh, a nice reminiscent. Well, uh, thank you very much. I will be happy to answer any questions, any and all questions. That's great. We, this was wonderful, Ada. We have a lot of questions. If you want to unshare and we can come back together as a group. Um, Stop share, okay. Yeah, and let me just uh, put a spotlight on you. Okay, so let me go back. There was a couple of questions. Um, when the when you were showing um, the snails putting their tails in the water, um, Salvador asked, "Is it possible for them to absorb nutrients that way?" Um. um I I don't know. Well. As I mentioned, we did some experiments in the lab and they were doing the same thing in the lab. Of course, I was just offering them water, just plain water, uh, but they were doing it. Um, um, I don't think so. I think it's just water. I, I don't know what nutrients there could be in in the water that has accumulated in a tree hole. I mean, there are a lot of things in it, of course, but I don't think there would be anything that would be of value to a slug. But I, I don't know, that's uh, you know something that uh, I should uh, 
keep in mind. Such a good research question. Alexander right. wants to know how uh, how do the slugs differentiate between bites to initiate sex or aggressive bites like the one that you showed? How, how does it do what? Differentiate between bites that initiate sex and the bites that are aggressive. I, I don't know. I mean, you can see in that video that, that the slug just comes uh, comes from back from the back of the other slug. It just I don't know why they are they 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 would be aggressive to each other. Um, maybe it's just uh, it, it doesn't. One slug doesn't want the other one to be there. I I don't know. Not all slugs are like that. It, you can see that in the pictures, there's some, some slugs huddle. They intentionally get together and that's how they rest. But apparently some the other slugs are more solitary. Again, um, I don't know why, uh, why the, the, the difference. Um, Laura wants to know if she has kids ask her why some slugs leave trails and some do not. Um, I think they they all do. It may it may depend on the um, the, the ground the, that they're on the substrate. The the trails become more visible. Uh, assuming I'm assuming that the, you're talking about the slime trails. You can. It, it just depends on um, the, 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 you know the surface. Some, on some surfaces, the trail is just not visible. On a concrete, it becomes more visible if the sun is shining from the back and, and, and if the slime becomes dry, it becomes more visible because it reflects light. Uh, but I think all slugs and snails produce slime. That's how they move. So they should all have, they should all leave a, a trail behind them. It's just not visible sometimes. All right. and. Um... Tom was interested, how well do slugs see? How is their vision? Um, I, I, I was, uh, I thought somebody would ask that question. Um, I don't think they see well, slugs or snails. They do have eyes and apparently at least some larger snails do have lenses in their eyes. Um, but, do they see? I don't know. Um, I have done some very simple experiments. You can do this yourself too. I had some slugs at home and when the slug was crawling, I held a, an opaque object right in front of its tentacles, the, the upper ones, like a, a pencil or something like that. And I very slowly brought it closer and closer to the tentacle to see when the, sl uh, the snail, uh, I'm sorry, the slug would uh, react to it. Um, it, it, didn't, it, it. It didn't react until the object I was holding in my hand was very close. It, it was within a few millimeters of the tip of the uh, tentacle where the eye was, when the slug actually withdrew the tentacle. Um, so from this, I concluded that they can't really see well, but that doesn't necessarily mean that maybe the slug sees the object as far, but it doesn't care until it's very close to it. So I, I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, how can you actually tell what a slug can see? We really can't, um, uh, but they do have, eyes and they, they do have lenses apparently in their eyes. But the, uh, the, the function of the eye may be primarily to detect light, you know, to di differentiate between light, uh, light and dark. So, to, you know, if the slug wants to get away from sunlight and if it's looking for a place to hide, which would be a darker for it. Um, so that, might, that may be the, primary function of, of the eyes. Um, Nick is interested, his son was keeping uh, some slugs as pets over the summer off and on with some success. Um, are there any books on slug husbandry? Um, 
I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. Um, there may be some books uh, for keeping snails as pets. Um, uh, and, the, the, and the advice in such a book would be, would also be uh, suitable for snails, uh, for slugs, but I, I can't, um, I don't know of any off the top of my head. All right. And Dick and Shelley um, said, can you address parasites and predators? Uh, I don't know if that means on the, on the, on the slugs or not, but um, that's their question. I, I believe some um, birds do eat slugs, although they're very slimy. Um, some birds, I believe, eat them. Uh, frogs probably eat them. And there are some uh, beetles, actually, that prey on slugs. I have not seen them, but I have read about them. Um, firefly larvae are known predators of snails. I'm not sure if in, this, if in North America they do that, but in Europe, they are um, predators, or they're known to be predators of snails. Uh, they may also feed on slugs. Um, parasites, they have some uh, nematode parasites or worms. Um, there are some mites, very small mites that live in their lungs, in the lungs of slugs. I have come across them on a few occasions. Um, other than that, um, I don't know if they have other, uh, other um, um, uh, parasites. Uh, there may be some uh, trematodes. Trematodes are um, types of worms. They are, I, I know they parasitize snails, but they may also parasitize um, slugs, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Salvador wants to know, do the slugs typically eat their own mucus or was that only after the sex decline back up? Um, they may eat their own mucus uh, on occasion, but they, they especially do that during mating. Again, it may have some, some, the, the, mucus that's produced during or before mating may have some uh, special chemicals in it to make the uh, you know the potential may uh, the partner more receptive uh, but they may also e eat them afterwards to sort of replenish what they have lost um, at least yes they do at least uh, during and after mating We have a lot of questions about um, uh, senses. Do they do they smell? Um, do they do what they smell? Sleep? Yeah. Do the slug the smug, the slugs smell and do they sleep and do they make noise? Do they speak? Do they? Well, I don't think they speak, but they may. Their radula may indeed make noise if it's rasping on something uh, that's hard, like a, like a, a tree trunk. Uh, although, you know, you would need a very sensitive microphone to pick that up. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if it did make some no, uh, noise. The, because the, the teeth on the radula are quite hard. And they can, they can you know, when they scrape, they, they should make noise. Um, do they smell? I don't know if they smell. I've never smelled one. Um, no, their sense but, of smell. How, how can they, their sense of smell? I'm sorry? Do they have a good sense of smell? Oh, do, oh, do they? Oh, oh, I thought you meant, if, if, um, the, yes, if, if, yes, they do smell. If you remember that, uh, the, that photograph I, I showed of um, one slug eating a, an earthworm on, a, on top of a rock and the other one was climbing uh, up from, uh, from under the rock and it just climbed up and went right to the earthworm. How did it know that there was an earthworm there? Um, I'm assuming it could somehow smell the presence of uh, 
the dead earthworm. Does it have a uh, smell? Lower, the lower tentacles may be used for that purpose. Um, do they? Do they have noses? No, they don't have noses. They use their tentacles. And do they sleep? Do they sleep? Um, well, it depends on what you call sleep. Uh, I sh if you remember that picture of uh, slugs in the tree cavity, there are periods when they do nothing but just sort of um, sit motionless, um, huddle motionless and you know, in a cavity, in a uh, in a hole, under a rock. Uh, I suppose you could call us sleeping uh, because they're not doing anything. They're not moving. They're just there. Um, so you know, if you say they're sleeping, then yes, they they do sleep. We've had several. Um, Maddie saw uh, box turtles eat slugs, and Kathy heard that possums eat slugs. Um, so that's. Uh, yeah, poss possibly, yes, yes, turtles probably eat them, yeah. And Dave wants to know, uh, how do you preserve slugs for dissection? Um, I use ethanol. You can probably use isopropyl alcohol. Uh, you need, if you put them directly in ethanol, usually 70% ethanol is used. Um, if you put a slug or a snail directly in, 70% ethanol, it will contract and it will produce lots of slime, especially uh, lots of mucus, especially the slugs do that. Um, and then afterwards, it will be difficult to dissect it. So what I do with slugs is put them in very dilute ethanol, uh, about 5%, um, which kills them very slowly. It takes several hours overnight um, you know that people sometimes use beer um, to trap and kill slugs in their gardens. Um, they, slugs are attracted to beer, probably not to the ethanol, but uh, to hops, I guess, or to, to the um, malt that is you know, making, that, that's in the beer. And then they fall in it and 5% ethanol is, is good to anesthetize them. Um, they and they can come out and they, it takes them several hours, but they die in an extended state. And you can then take them out and wash them, remove the remove the um, all the mucus, and then you can put them in seventy percent ethanol to preserve them before uh, you can dissect them, or you can dissect them um, right away. You don't have to preserve them. Um, what do wor uh, do slugs? How do they taste? Do they have taste buds? Worms uh, um, taste through their. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, probably, yeah, probably they do. <laughs> do you know if they use their skin to taste? I don't know. Probably they have some sort of sense organs on their skin, uh, but uh, you know. I guess you can call it tasting, but. There's a lot of experiments that this group can do. We can start uh, seeing if they, yeah. if yes. they the other. Um, Dean says, do humans eat slugs like snails with garlic and butter? Uh, no, I've never heard of humans eating slugs. Um, no, I, I don't, no, not, not like they eat snails. No, not regularly. No, I, they, they sort of warn against doing that, especially raw slugs, because they may have nematodes in them. And then the nematodes may pass on to the humans. So it's not recommended that one, uh, one should do that. One should try eating raw slugs or snails because of uh, potential parasites that may be present in them. Bronwyn, can I chime in a second on eating slugs? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, they can the uh, the slugs out there, and they do sell them in cans of uh, slug chowder that they make. So they do harvest them in the Pacific Northwest for clam chowder, or not uh, slug chowder. I'm sorry, slug chowder that they make. Chowder. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's interesting. Okay. Any of the airports out there uh, in, in Washington State, you could find uh, cans of slug chowder for sale and uh, these big banana slugs that are out in the forests. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My two cents. I, I don't know if I would ever try it, but oh, it was good to know. <laughs> We have a dare coming on. Alexander says, um, how do slugs choose? Do they choose their sexual partners? Um, are they looking for bigger penises? Right. I read about that, um, that they, at least one species does that. One uh, slug uh, eats the penis of the other one. Sometimes, I, I believe, not always. Um, so the, but people don't know why they do that. Um, one, one hypothesis is that that way the slug, so when, when they mate, they exchange sperm. So what, what, when one slug eats the penis of, the, of its partner after, after they have mated, the, the slug without, one slug is left without a penis. So it cannot mate anymore because it does not have a penis anymore. So it will have to then keep using the sperm it has received from its partner. So that, that's the only uh, explanation I have seen for that behavior. But what are, do they have any, any preference in their sexual partners? Are they looking for something particular in the partner that, that, that helps them choose? Or is any, any, good, oh. any slug? Across, okay. I don't know. I mean, how can you possibly tell? They all look the same to me. I, I don't know. There, there must be something in, in the way they taste their mucus tastes. All right. Um, I have one question. The, when the first slide that you showed with the um, radula uh, uh, trails through the algae, um, do can you tell which type of snail, uh, which type of slugs are uh, there based on the shape and size and of that's, the, that's, of the right? That's a good question. Um, it it may be possible to tell them apart from those tracks, but I I, I guess it would be difficult. You would have to do a lot of tests. Um, put out you know, known species and see well, what sort of tracks they leave behind and then compare them. Um, so, and th there may be differences between their tracks because their teeth do differ between, not, not necessarily between species, but between genera. There are differences in their um, teeth. Um, so presumably, the tracks they leave behind would also be different, but would it be fine? Would, would the tracks be fine enough to distinguish between uh, different species? That I don't know. Maybe you can tell a small one from a big one, but you know, if you have two different species of about the same size, then it would probably be difficult to tell them apart. That's my guess. And uh, Laura says, so just to be clear, when they exchange sperm, they're, they're, they're storing the sperm for later fertilization? Do they store? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. You mean to fertilize their eggs later? Um, I, I don't know if they do that. Maybe. I don't have the answer. All right, do we have any other questions for Aiden? This has been a fascinating talk. Yes, Dean, everybody's saying thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You have piqued everybody's interest in slugs. We're all gonna go <laughs> look under rocks and look on trees and uh, you have, you have we've shined a spotlight on a on a one of our creatures that 
that we don't pay a lot of attention to and maybe we should. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for organizing this and uh, thank you everyone for uh, listening to me. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us um, and exercising your curiosity muscle. I hope to see you all next week when we learn from the Gemological Institute of America about the chemistry of gemstones. So you can register an RSVP for that on our website, uh, marylandnature.org. And maybe become a member, become one of our community curators and uh, help us uh, get to 100 years young with this organization. But uh, thank you, Aiden. Everybody stay well um, and stay curious. Good night, everybody. Good night.